uh, to the Ocean Room at uh, IC Central, uh, which is appropriate enough from my point of view because I'd like to talk to you today uh, about some of the issues related to Australia's coasts and oceans, particularly in the context of climate change and global sea level rise. Uh, as pretty much everyone here will probably be aware, there's a line in the Australia's national anthem that Australia is girt by sea. Fair enough, I wouldn't object to that. Uh, although I have had it, heard it observed that really the line should read that Australia is girt by beach. Because for most of us, our maritime horizon is pretty narrow. Uh, we go down to the beach and we might get as far out offshore as going for a surf. Uh, what I'd like to share with you today really is that we're also girt by uncertainty and the impact of sea level rise uh, that there may be both territorially on our land territory, but also in terms of the scope of our maritime jurisdiction. We are a lucky country uh, in terms of uh, our space. We have broad uh, land areas, uh, but we also, uh, what is less well acknowledged, I think, a degree of sea blindness exists. Uh, we are one of the major world powers in terms of the scope of our maritime jurisdiction. We have the third largest national jurisdiction on the planet. So at least we get a podium finish. Uh, the reason that we have such broad zones of maritime jurisdiction is twofold. We have a very, very long coastline, just shy of 60,000 kilometers in length. Uh, we also claim the full suite of zones of maritime jurisdiction allowable under international law. Uh, so you can see a whole series of zones there, uh, and they extend far, far offshore from our coastline. To illustrate that, we have a little bit of a schematic uh, whereby we can see the intersection of the ocean against the coast, and we have what is termed territorial sea baselines. This is really the answer to the, the seemingly fairly self-evident question of where does the land end and where does the sea begin? In international legal terms, uh, what we're really talking about is the baselines along the coast, and predominantly globally, and also for Australia, most baselines are determined in accordance with the location of the low water line along the coast. From the low water line, we generate a whole series of zones of jurisdiction. Landward of the baseline, we have either land territory or our uh, internal waters within ports, within estuaries, and so forth. From the baseline, we generate a 12-mile territorial sea, a contiguous zone to 24 miles, a 200 nautical mile extent exclusive economic zone, and underlying that, we have continental shelf rights and indeed potential for extended continental shelf, that is, continental shelf that is seaward of the 200 nautical mile limit. Over the last few years, Australia has been finalizing its extended continental shelf and has now had it confirmed that we have an additional 2.56 million square kilometers of extended shelf beyond the 200 mile limit. Now, 2.56 million square kilometers, it's a big number. I, I have difficulties with big numbers. I can't visualize them properly unless I compare it to something. So it's like adding the entire land area of Western Australia to our already impressively large zones of maritime jurisdiction. The point here is that all of those maritime zones are dependent on the location of the baseline. The, the baseline provides our starting point for measuring all of these spatial zones. The difficulty is that low water lines and coasts are dynamic. They move over time. I'll give you one example of that, those the international areas beyond our national zones. And I admit from the outset, this is an extreme example. This is McDonald Island. Uh, it is an Australian territory. Uh, we're deep down into the sub-Antarctic here, 4,200 and some kilometers southwest of Perth. Um, on the right, we have an, the aerial photography uh, that the Australian Hydrographic Service used to construct the Australian nautical chart of McDonald Island. And I have to thank the Australian Hydrographic Service for the loan of these graphics. On the left, we have the outline of that aerial photography of that former coastline 
overlaid on a more recent satellite image of the same feature, of McDonald Island. No real prizes here for guessing what character of feature McDonald Island is. It goes bang. It's a volcano. So it's doubled in size. The consequence of this is a, really a win for Australia in this context. Our low water line has extended further out, and therefore our zones of maritime jurisdiction claimable from McDonald Island have expanded. The difficulty we face is global sea level change and sea level rise. Now, we can spend an extended period of time talking about sea level rise and the uncertainties related to sea level rise. There's general consensus about the reality of sea level rise. There's uncertainty about how swiftly it will occur and by how much. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change suggests up to 58 centimeters by the end of the century in its fourth assessment report. That prediction has been heavily criticized as being too conservative. The Australian government's own plausible worst-case scenario is 1.1 meters of sea level rise by the end of the century. The consequence of that, the implication, is that for low waterline baselines, as the sea level rises, the baseline will retreat inland. Clearly, that has consequences as far as our land territory is concerned, about our infrastructure, our population along the coast. For Australia, we have 85% of the population within the coastal zone. So clearly, it's a major concern from our perspective. But there are also impacts to the seaward side, which are less well acknowledged. We generally generate the limits of our maritime claims through an envelope of arcs type effect. There we go. We generate our, our outer limit to our maritime zones. We may get lucky. We may have deposition along the coastline and extending our coastline, and therefore, we may gain as a consequence of recalculating that limit. Sea level rise would seem to imply that the coastline, the baseline, will retreat to the landward and thereby is a risk of losing maritime space from the national jurisdiction. This is problematic uh, because those national maritime spaces are critically and increasingly important to us. We only need to glance out of the window to see the ships that are standing offshore Wollongong waiting to go into Port Kembla. The oceans are critically important from an access point of view for Australia. 99% of our volume of trade goes by sea. But all, the oceans are also, and coasts, are important to us socially, culturally, environmentally, and economically. We think in terms of the rights to and access over marine resources uh, within those maritime zones. Uh, I'd say on a global level, 4.3 billion people are reliant on fish for at least 15% of their protein needs. So purely in terms of those resources, they are important to states. The question is, what do we do? Well, there are several options here, and this is the, uh, the, the context of the, the research that uh, we're undertaking. One option would be to do nothing. It's not necessarily the most politically palatable of options, but it is, in a sense, a realization that coasts will reach their own natural equilibrium. So there are, in a way, ways to address the changing of the coastline through planning offsets, whereby you set back building away from the coastline. The difficulty is, of course, we love living near the, near the sea and as close to the beach as possible. One way in which they, uh, we have explored this in the Netherlands, one proposal, is yes, you can build wherever you like. You can build as close to the ocean as you like, so long as your house floats. Houses on pontoons. So we have planning options. The traditional instinct where coastlines are threatened is to protect the coast. Coastal engineering structures to stabilize the coastline. The difficulty there is that by building such structures by intervening in natural processes, one tends to end up with unforeseen and unwelcome consequences. Protect one part of the coastline, you starve the sediment from another part of the coastline and end up with erosion. Another extreme example, uh, this is the southernmost part territory of Japan, called the Kinotorishima, uh, from which Japan claims a full 200-mile economic zone, 
rather controversy. Not every neighbor of Japan quite agrees with this. It's been described as the size of a king-size bed. It was under threat from erosion in the late 1980s, and the reaction was to protect it with 360-degree sea defenses that are vertically higher than the naturally formed feature itself. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Kiribati, which is, this is Tarawa in Kiribati. You can see on a sign, this is the highest point in Kiribati at three meters in, in height, and it says, rising seas and drowning islands. Building sea defenses for this kind of atoll where you have narrow strips of land with ocean on both sides is essentially impractical. So what we're looking at, in a sense, is legal options whereby the maritime jurisdiction of states can be preserved, can, the, breaking the link between baselines, which are essentially ambulatory, they move over time, and the outer limits of maritime claims. This does not fix the problem, of course, of sea level rise, but what it does do is, in a sense, preserve already existing maritime claims. That's a key issue from the point of view of Australia with our long coastline and broad maritime claims. For small Pacific island states, it's of a different order of magnitude. It's an acute national concern. It's about national survival. If we have a, the potential consequence of the total inundation of states, by preserving maritime claims, we at least would be able to preserve some kind of bargaining chip whereby those governments would be able to, uh, in a sense, secure the future for their threatened populations who are threatened with being displaced out of their homes. Thank you very much for your kind attention.